Good afternoon, everyone. And I, as I mentioned, I'm the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and we're honored to have Governor Cuomo here today. So we've got a few dignitaries we need to acknowledge, and by few, I mean a lot. So please hold your applause while I um, call everyone, and I apologize in advance, as they say at church, please call it to my heart, not my mind, excuse me, my mind, not my heart, if I mis mispronounce your name. So first we have, from the administration, Michael Hine, Commissioner of New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Serv Assistance. Howard Zucker, Commissioner of New York State Department of Health. Roberta Reardon, Commissioner of New York State Department of Labor. Sheila Poole, Commissioner of New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Ruth Hassell Thompson, Special Advisor for Policy and Community Affairs, New York State Homes and Community Renewal. Kelly Owens, Executive Director, New York Office of, for the Prevention of Domestic Violence. My boss, Felix Matos Rodriguez, Chancellor of the City University of New York. Barbara Gwynn, Executive Deputy Commissioner, New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance. And we have several elected officials joining us today. <clears throat> Zellner, Senator Zellner Myrie, Assemblyman Member Pat Fahey, Assembly Member Nick Perry, State Senator Leroy Comrie, Assembly Member Diana Richardson, Senator Robert Jackson, Assembly Member Stephanie Zinnerman, Assembly Member Clyde Vanell, Senator John Brooks, Assembly Member Jennifer Rajkumar, Mayor uh, Waylon Hobbs from the Village of Hempstead, and we have several advocates here. We have Mark Marial, my <laughs> president of the National Urban League, and my former partner from my old days at DOJ. We have Rebecca Fisher, executive director of uh, NA, NYAGV. We have Hazel Dukes, president of the New York State NAACP. We have Jackie Rowe Adams, Harlem Mothers Save. We have Linda Bagel Schulman, founder of the Scott Eagle Memorial Fund. Reverend Franklin Richardson from Grace Baptist Church. Reverend Dr. Johnny Green from Mount Nebo Baptist Church and President and CEO of MPAC New York. Bishop Orlando uh, Finlay Finlater, New Hope Christian Fellowship. Pastor Carl Washington Jr., New, excuse me, New Mount Zion Baptist Church and President of the Empire Baptist Missionary Convention. We have Iman Tahi Kukaj, Albanian Islamic Cultural Center. Chaplain Robert Rice, United Chaplain, State of New York, Pastor Carl Wark, City of Refuge, New York, Aisha Sekou, founder of Street Corner Resources, Pastor Jeffrey Crenshaw, New Mount Zion Baptist Church, Christian Hine, Vice President for Policy at Brady, all of the advocates for moms and students demand action, See them in their beautiful red. Gary LaBarbera, President, New York City Building and Construction Trades Council. Camera Jackson, Elite Learners. Julie Samuels, Tech New York City. And Erica Ford, founder, Life Camp and the New York Fund Peace Coalition. Thank you all for your tireless advocacy and valuable input. Now you have it. I want to thank Governor Cuomo for his leadership in New York State during our challenging and unprecedented time. We are grateful that he has chosen John Jay for today's important address. The events of the last year, including COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, the protests against police violence, and rising rates of gun violence in communities across the United States point to the urgent need to address public safety. And address, addressing public safety goes beyond responding to crime but also includes addressing the racial and economic inequities in our communities. John Jay is in a unique position to help chart the future of our country's course on public safety. We are a minor majority minority institution and reflect the voices of diverse communities across this state that need to be heard as we move forward. John Jay is committed to developing the research, policies, practices, and most importantly, the people who support safe communities. This is why last fall, John Jay, in partnership with the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, brought leaders from all across the country, including police chiefs, community leaders, elected officials, 
and advocates to talk about how to create public safety that is community-led. Out of these meetings, we developed our Future of Public Safety framework to guide communities in a holistic approach to public safety, one in which the end goal is not the absence of crime, but where people's needs are met and they have the ability to thrive and be successful. Our Future of Public Safety framework goes well beyond policing and calls on government and community to act together in a number of ways. Community members, especially young people, should be leading the conversation about what safety looks like and how to achieve it. Institutions beyond the police, such as public health agencies, community-based nonprofits, and all of us should play a central role in creating safety by preventing and addressing conflict through education, social services, and violence interruption, which you'll hear more about from the governor. Police departments must address both violence in the community and the role they have played in racial injustice in order to gain the community's trust. The governor's presence today is further validation of John Jay's work to promote safety, justice, and peace in partnerships with the communities and institutions they serve. Please join me in welcoming our governor, the 56th governor of the state of New York, Governor Andrew M. Cuomo. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Oh, it's a better afternoon than that. Come on. Good afternoon. Uh, first to Madam President, uh, Carol Mason with a K. Uh, thank you. Thank you for hosting us today. Let's give Carol Mason a round of applause. We also want to thank John Jay for doing innovative work. Uh, we need a new model of public safety. That is clear. We need to restore the relationship between the community and the police. That is clear. Uh, and it's, it's time to do it. It is time to do it. The community demands it. Uh, it takes thought. It's not easy. And John Jay, in many ways, is leading the way, and we're going to be partnering with them. So let's give them another round of applause. To all the elected officials who are here, to the assembly members and the senators, there are enough here, I think. We have a quorum. We could do a special session, but we don't want to do a special session. Uh, to the clergy members, pleasure to be with you. To all the advocates, the civil rights organizations, to Hazel Dukes, because I'm not forgetting Hazel Dukes. If there's one name I'm mentioning, it's Hazel Dukes. Let's give Hazel a round of applause. Mark Morial from the Urban League, pleasure to be with you, Mark. All the gun advocacy groups that have done so much good work uh, for so many, many years. Uh, you know the topic? The topic is gun violence. Uh, and uh, let's talk about it. Uh, 2020, we don't want to go back there again. It was a year like we never saw before. And it was a year of crisis. The whole question for 2020 was just survival. We weren't living our lives. We weren't thriving. It was just a question of survival. Uh, I like to call it low tide in America, because COVID didn't come alone. COVID created a low tide. What does low tide mean? You go to the beach, and when the tide is up, it looks beautiful. You stand on the sand and you look forward and everything is beautiful. Low tide, the tide goes out and it exposes all this ugliness that was on the bottom. COVID created low tide in America. You saw the ugliness on the bottom that was there all along, but it was just covered up. What did COVID do? It hit the communities hardest that had underlying conditions that didn't have access to health care, that were predominantly black and brown communities. That's what COVID did. When it came to education and remote learning, it worked great for some students who had the equipment, who had the help at home. But for poorer students, black students, brown students, they were left behind during remote learning. When it comes to the economy and jobs, 
it was those poor communities and black and brown communities that had the highest COVID infection rate that actually had the fewest opportunities. I want to thank the people in this room because they were the first to stand up in the nation and say, when it comes to COVID and testing and vaccinations, the black and brown and poor communities better be at the front of the line because they're the most infected in the nation and they paid the highest price. And that voice echoed around this country. 2020, our issue was keeping people safe. And everyone agreed to it. Why? Because it was a matter of life and death. 2021, we're post-COVID. Knock wood, knock everything. We're post-COVID, but there's still low tide inequality, and it is still a matter of life and death. We went from one epidemic to another epidemic. We went from COVID to the epidemic of gun violence and the fear and the death that goes along with it. It's been all over the newspapers. It is undeniable. It's so bad that when you look at the recent numbers, more people are dying of gun violence yes. than of COVID. Yes. Yes. More people are dying of co gun violence and crime than COVID. 51 people died of COVID over the July 4th weekend. I'm sorry, 51 were shot, 13 died of COVID over the July 4th weekend. And that was just the July 4th weekend. Somebody said to me, on July 4th weekend, those weren't fireworks you were hearing, those were gunfire that you were hearing. We're losing young people, we're losing them tragically, we're use, losing them needlessly. And gun violence and crime hurt all New Yorkers. If we talk about uh, getting New York back post-COVID, uh, I'll tell you something. It's a different world. You're not going to take that Zoom and put it back in a box. You're not going to take remote work and put it back in a box. People have options. They spent a year working from home, working from other places. OK, now you have to get back on the subway and back on the train and go to work every day. Well, hold on. I can stay home, and I can work from home. That would be devastating for the economy. People have to want to come back to work. They're going to have to want to come back to New York City. And the sine qua non for that, the but for for that, is they have to feel safe. They're not coming back unless they feel safe. I can't tell you how many people tell me Tell the MTA, I'm afraid to get on the subways. I'm afraid to get on the subways. Now, this is a national problem. I get it. But somebody has to step up and somebody has to address it. And the place that should step up and address it is the state of New York. And we should do it comprehensively and honestly and creative. And that's what today is all about. Because this is the state, when it sees an injustice, we don't look the other way. We stand up and we fight it, and that's what we're going to do with gun violence. Let's start with the facts. Let's start with the facts. Forget the rhetoric, forget the rhetoric, forget in politics, just facts, okay? Gun violence, number one cause of premature death in the United States. Gun violence cost over $280 billion in health care societal costs every year. July 4th weekend, 14 people shot in Buffalo, five shot in Syracuse, three shot on Long Island, two shot in Utica, one was shot in Rochester. 26 people shot in New York City over the July 4th weekend. Shootings were up 38% in New York City over the first six months compared to 2020. Fact, gun violence discriminates. The way COVID discriminated, gun violence discriminates. When you look among the victims of gun violence nationally, 59% non-white, 
New York State, 68% non-white. New York City, 77% non-white. Think about that. 77% black and brown. Black people are 10 times more likely to be victims of gun violence than white people. Latinos are 3.4 times more likely to be victims of gun violence than young people. Gun violence is a major civil rights issue today. Yes, education. Yes, employment. Yes, discrimination. But also gun violence. Gun violence is hitting the black and brown communities hardest, and it's compounding the damage from COVID. Now, what's the solution? There is no one solution. These great legislators can't go back to Albany and pass one law to do it. They already did everything they could. New York State passed the strongest gun law in the United States of America. We did that. We did that. It was called the SAFE Act. It did everything that this nation should do now. Why do you need an assault weapon to hunt a deer? Why? Why don't you do a background check? Why don't you close the loopholes? New York did it. We have those laws in place. Gun violence is not only taking a human toll, it's taking an economic toll. So we have no choice but to address it. It's the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. And in many ways, this state can't afford not to do it. When you look at the past, as crime goes up, people in the city goes down. As crime goes up, the economy goes down. We've seen it. We've lived it. When you get a hold of crime, when you get a hold of gun violence, when that reduces, population increases. Economic activity increases. We know the pattern. We just don't want to relive the pattern. So the future of this state, the future of the black and brown young people, all depends on our ability to get this recent gun crisis under control. How do we fight it? You come up with a plan, and you do it. That's it. It's not that hard. Come up with a smart plan and do it. But I mean do it. Our strategy has to have two prongs. We have to have a long-term strategy, short-term. Long-term, the solution is a comprehensive community-based preventive strategy so young people don't get into this situation in the first place. They don't uh, arrive at a place of crisis. You don't have the same level of violence. You don't have the same level of antagonism. And that's from community-based services. That's prevention, it's community development, it's housing, it's health care, it's economic opportunity. But today, let's focus on the short term, because people are dying every day out there. Time is not on our side. Begin by acknowledging the problem. And you know what the problem is? It is a statewide problem, and it is an emergency. And I want the people of the state to understand that. And I want them to respond to the emergency for the way it is. So today, first state in the nation is going to declare a disaster emergency on gun violence. Thank you. Thank you. What does this do, this executive order? First, it says to everyone in the state, I want you to understand the extent of the problem. I want you to understand how serious this is. It then also allows us to move even faster and free up money and free up programs so we can get it on the street and we can get it on the street now. We also need a comprehensive plan of attack. We're going to have seven steps. One, treat gun violence as it is, which is really a public health emergency. That's what it is, and that's how we're going to treat it. Second, target the hot spots 
where the gun violence is coming from. It's not coming from every community everywhere. You can find out exactly where it's coming from and you can target it. Third, you have to have a positive engagement with the at-risk youth. You can't just say, no, don't do it. You have to have a positive that you're applying. We have to break the cycle of the escalating violence because you see it coming. You see two groups fighting, one shot, two shot, four shots, ten shots. You can interrupt that, that progression of violence, and that's what we have to do. We have to get illegal guns off the street, and we have to get the guns out of hands of dangerous people, and we have to rebuild the police community relationship, period. Step one, treat it like a public health issue. We know how to deal with an epidemic. What we want to say is, we want to do with gun violence what we just did with COVID. That's what we want. We want the same level of attention, the same level of energy. Look what we did with COVID. We had the highest infection rate in the United States of America for months. They looked at us and they pointed, oh, that's New York. That's a New York problem, COVID. Must be them. Must be the way they live. Must be what they eat. Something about those people in New York caused COVID. No, we didn't cause COVID. COVID came on the plane from Europe when we had the White House telling us it's in China, China, China. No, it left China, went to Europe, went to Italy, France, Spain, got on a plane, landed at JFK airport, and infected New York. That's why we had the highest rate of infection in the nation. And we took that highest rate of infection on our own, and we brought it to the lowest rate of infection in the United States of America. That's what we can do when we focus and we all work together and we say we have to get this done. We need to do the same thing with gun violence. This is not just a criminal justice issue, it's a public health issue, it's a jobs issue, it's a substance abuse issue, and we have to coordinate them all together, and that's what we're going to do in New York State. We're going to create the first office to prevent gun violence in the Department of Health. We're going to come up with a comprehensive, organized, science and data-driven approach. We're going to make sure all the agencies are working together, we're going to reach out to the local community and make them part of it. We're going to issue an executive order today that says, I want from all the police departments across the state exactly where these shootings are happening so we have the information and we know where to target and we know where to address. We also want to form a council on gun violence prevention that gets your minds at the table to develop a strategy and the laws that we need to make a difference. And this council will make recommendations as to what laws are working and what laws are not working. It's got to put policy over politics. I'm tired of everybody using rhetoric on this issue pass the laws that save lives. Right. Everything is on the table. We all want the same thing, and that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Step two, get smart. Use science, like we did on COVID. How did we attack COVID? We mapped it, and we found out where it was, and we found the clusters, and then we attacked the clusters. You can do the same thing with gun violence. You can look at where those shootings are happening, and you can attack them there. And by the way, they're happening in an in a incredibly small area that is creating the vast majority of the shootings. Buffalo, New York, 3.2% of the at-risk youth, 60% of the shootings. 3% of the youth, 60% of the shootings. 
Albany, 3% of the at-risk youth, 66% of the shootings. It's this way all across the state. Syracuse, New York, 2% of the at-risk youth, 47%. It's true in Suffolk. It's true in Nassau. It's true in Hempstead. It's true in New York City. 0.7% of the at-risk youth have done 36% of the shootings. 4,000 young men, 18 to 24, across the state, responsible for 48% of the shootings. Once someone tells you that, once you know that, what do you say? Reach out to those 4,000 young men in a state of 19 million and help them and stop the violence. And that's exactly what we have to do. You know where it's coming from. You know where you need to go. <laughs> Step three is positive engagement. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't take drugs. Don't shoot. Yeah, OK. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? What is my alternative? What am I supposed to do? Low tide in America. You know when you started to see the spike? During COVID. Why? I'm not in school. I have nowhere to go. I have no job. Uh, if you're rich, whoa, then you went out to the Hamptons. Then you went out to the Hudson Valley. Then your parents took you to Florida. They took you to Aspen. You had a lot of options. If you're not rich and you're living in public housing, you have the hallways to play in. Go spend a year running up and down the hallways. Go to the little broken down playground where you have nothing. No activities, no support, nothing. Why do kids get into trouble? What else are they supposed to do? Where was the productive activity? The best thing we can do for those at-risk youth, you reach them today and say, I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to give you an alternative. I'm going to give you training. And I'm going to give you a job. You have an alternative. It is a job. We have learned participation in summer jobs programs dramatically changes what happens reduces violence by 45%, the summer jobs programs. That was all but gone last year. We have to create a jobs program unlike anything ever done before. We have to get everyone, the business leaders, the labor community, the government, and we have to create jobs for these kids to get them off the street. New York State will pay 100% of the salary we just want them to get training and a place to go and that education so they see a future. <laughs> Labor movement will be part of it. The big business organizations will be part of it. But we want every business opening their doors to employ these at-risk youth, and we want them doing it now. I want to thank Gary LaBarbera from Organized Labor and the Consortium for Worker Education. We're going to hire young people, train them, put them on the job, and then not just give them a job, but give them a good paying career when they finish with school so they know this is not just a stopgap. You can be a carpenter, you can be an electrician, you can be a tradesman, you can have an entire future ahead of you. And that's what we're going to be doing. We are announcing today the largest investment in this type of jobs program ever, $57 million from the state of New York to create 21,000 jobs. <laughs> Step four. Break the cycle of escalating violence. Like COVID, gun violence spreads like a virus. 50% of homicides have been with people associated with gangs previously. 
there are young people out there who are not just shot once. They're shot one, two, three, four, five times. And they've gotten lucky. There is an approach that says when that young person arrives in the hospital, you intervene at that moment with that young person. And you say, you were shot. Your attitude is you're going to get up and get out and go back to the street and shoot the guy who shot you. I know what you're going to do. You're going to get your friends, and now you're going to start a war. And there's going to be more people coming back. You intervene at that point, and you say there's a different way. That's where you catch them. That's where you grab them. That's where you put them on a different path. We did this program in a hospital in the Bronx, Jacoby Hospital. Uh, a place called the Giffords Law Center studied it. S shootings fell 60% in that precinct when you intervened with people through the hospitals. We have to do this statewide, and we're going to do it now. We know that snug programs work and outreach programs work. We're going to increase them by 112% immediately so they are on the ground for this summer. And we have to create alternatives. You need sports programs and arts programs and training programs, and you need places that are open, and we're going to triple funding for those activities in these hot spots. <laughs> Step five, you have to get illegal guns off the street. Right. Illegal guns. Why? With our law, it effectively has stopped guns. Thank God I don't even want to mention it. When you look at mass shootings, there is no state that has a lower number of mass shootings than this state. It is not a coincidence, it's because of our law. But the guns are still coming in. 74% of the guns used from out of state. They're coming from out of state. We have to stop the guns coming from out of state. We announced today a border war. And the border war is we're going to stop guns from coming in through our borders and into our cities. We know where they're coming from. They're coming from the south. And we're going to declare a border war to stop it. As a matter of fact, I have a vision. I have a vision of a border war. Because we wasted so much time and money in this nation fighting illegal immigration. Illegal immigration is not killing Americans. Illegal guns are killing Americans. So here's my vision. It just came to me. Picture the border. We build a wall. <laughs> we build a tall, big, a beautiful wall. And we have the wall goes for miles. And we have a little gold leaf up at the top of the wall. Little gold, shiny leaf. And then we put a big name across the wall. And the name. The name is five letters. You know the name? I can see it. Can you see it? C-U-O-M-O. -O. And it's a magic wall. People can pass, but illegal guns cannot pass. It's a magic wall. That's what we need here in New York, and that's what we have needed. Maybe that vision won't work. OK, so we'll get the state police. And we're going to form a special unit in the state police to focus on the border and stop illegal guns from coming in. We're then going to work with our partner states, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. We're going to share all the data, get best practices on traffic stops. 
we're going to work together to stop the illegal guns from coming into this state once and for all. We're also going to say New York is going to do what Congress didn't do. Congress actually passed a law that holds gun makers immune from lawsuits. Okay? I know this too well. Last year of the Clinton administration, we had the gun manufacturers who were being sued by cities, by groups. Mark Morial was there. And we went to the gun manufacturers and we said, we'll end these suits, but you have to agree to a safe gun policy. Fingerprint ID technology they had, where the trigger would only work for the fingerprint of the authorized user. They would get rid of all the uh, bad dealers. Uh, they would stop marketing to children. It was all set up. Reduce the capacity magazines. Smith & Wesson signs the agreement in the Clinton administration, agrees to the safe gun agreement. We have a ceremony in the Rose Garden with Bill Clinton as president. We thought this was a new day, that we actually going to have a smart, safe gun agreement where we were going to stop the illegal sales, stop the sales. Just the fingerprint technology alone would have saved thousands of lives. We have the ceremony in the Red Room. George Bush announces if he's president, he's going to pass a law that gives the gun manufacturers immunity so no other gun manufacturer should sign on to our safe gun agreement. Smith & Wesson had already signed. Smith & Wesson was the largest handgun manufacturer in the United States. NRA reared up its ugly head. They fired the president of Smith & Wesson. They said to all the gun manufacturers, don't do any, do any, wait to see if Bush is elected. Yeah. I had been negotiating with the gun manufacturers. I said, oh, don't worry, waiting, because Gore's going to be elected. <laughs> they said, okay, well, on the off chance that you're wrong and Bush gets elected, we're going to wait. Bush gets elected, he passes immunity. Only industry in the United States of America, only industry in the United States of America immune from lawsuits are the gun manufacturers, thanks to George Bush and the NRA. New York is going to sign a law today that reinstates the public nuisance liability for gun manufacturers. This is going to be a very big deal. I want to thank Senator Zellner, Myrie. Senator Zelnamiri, Assembly Member Pat Fay, he took the lead. They did a great job. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Step six, keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. The Trump administration was so pro-gun, they did insane things. They said a person with active warrants should be allowed to purchase a gun. We said, that's crazy. And today I'm signing legislation to close that Trump loophole. If you have an active warrant, you cannot buy a gun in the state of New York, period. Thank the legislature for passing that. And I want, want to thank all the advocacy groups for working so hard for getting that bill passed. <laughs> Last step is step seven. The police community relationship must be reformed. Yes, yes. And restoration of community trust will only happen with reformation of the police. Yes. You are not, you are not, going to get the community to trust the police again until they see real change. And they are right. They are right. But that has to be the first step to address that relationship. Why? When it doesn't work, 
You know what you find? Fewer 911 calls, fewer police doing patrols in the neighborhood. You see gun violence and crime goes up. We've seen it before. I tried to force the local governments to do the reform. So last year I said, every locality that has a police department, 493, you must sit down with the community and you must do reform. And they started. They started. And they all put in a plan. They had to put in a plan by April. They all did put in a plan. They didn't want to do it because it's controversial. Uh, but I use this gentle persuasion. If you don't do it, then the state is not going to give you any money. And then they said, oh, we'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, some are better than others. Some are more ambitious than others. NAACP worked on this all across the state, but it was a start. It was a start. Uh, and now those reforms are starting to be implemented, but we have to do more. And we're going to ask John Jay to work with us to share those best lessons among localities. <laughs> because the reform has to be bolder. It has to be bolder. And trust is a two-way street. You want to trust the community? The community needs to trust you. And there have been bad incidents. We passed a law, and today I'm going to issue regulations that says if there is a police officer who creates misconduct in one police department, we have to stop the shell game of where that police officer winds up in a different department and everybody closes their eyes. That's going to stop. And it's time for us to reimagine policing. There's an old expression. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You only have one tool. Well, you know what? When all you have are handcuffs and a gun, then the only thing that's going to amount to is an arrest. That is what you have, and that is all you can do. That does not work anymore in this society. 9-11 calls, they are more diverse. They are mental health calls. They are substance abuse calls. They are youth in crisis calls. They are domestic violence and family crisis calls. They are substance abuse calls. Not everything requires handcuffs and a gun. It has to be a different approach to actually address those problems. We need more community-based services on the one hand, and then we need more responsive approaches to those 911 calls. That's the essence of reimagining the police department. Everything changes. We change the way we educate in schools. We change the way we work. We change the way we use technology. Policing has been basically the same for 50 years. It is time we reimagine and reinvent, and we do it together. We have to do two things simultaneously. We have to reform the police, but at the same time, we have to address gun violence. We have to do both at the same time. It's not one or the other, because we're losing too many young people out there every day. Now, reforming the police is hard. This is a politically difficult situation. So the first instinct of the political process is what? Deny the problem. Or avoid the problem. Avoid the problem. Why? Because you're not going to make everybody happy. This first meeting is going to be a nasty meeting. Police have very strong feelings. Community has very strong feelings. Nobody wants to get in the middle of that. But my father taught me many good lessons. 
One of them was denying a problem never works. It doesn't work in your personal life. It doesn't work for government. You deny a drug problem. You deny a family problem. All you do is postpone it. You think you're going to avoid a problem and it's going to go away? It never goes away. It gets worse. It's time to step up and address this issue city by city, putting people in a room, talking it through, reimagining the police department that works for that community where that community walks out of the room and says, I trust that police department now. I put out my hand. We're going to work, out, work together hand in glove. But it has to happen now. Gun violence and crime should be the top priority for every mayor in this state because every city has been affected by it. It is a matter of saving lives. And New York's future depends on it. People are not coming back to this city. They're not coming back to any city until they know they are safe. I can give as many speeches as I want to the business community. Come back, it's safe. We have COVID under control. We're building all these projects to inspire people. All new airports, upstate New York, new LaGuardia Airport, new JFK Airport, new Moynihan Train Hall. We're building all these projects to say, be confident in New York's economy. Stay with us. Don't move away. And they say, my people are afraid to get on the subway. I'm afraid to come into work. We have to address this issue. People only will come back if people feel safe. Now, this is normally not a state role. This is not what we do. We're the state government. But these are not normal times. And the state can bring funding and intensity and attention and support. The state can help coordinate all these pieces, because you have to have all these pieces working. The interrupters have to work with the local leaders, have to work with local government, have to work with mental health, have to work with the clergy, which has a very big role to play in the community-based organizations. But it all has to come ground up. It's not going to come from this room down. It's going to come from the street up. It's going to come community by community, putting together that plan for that community. We have to have all the people at the table, all the stakeholders at the table, community groups, the schools, the clergy, local police, service providers, everybody at the table, interrupters, snug, and come up with a plan that works for that community. We have the job placement available. We can fund recreation services. We can fund interveners. We can identify the hot spots within the hot spot. But we need to do that on a community level. That's the only way it's going to work. We have the funding. We have the emergency declaration so we can expedite it. But we have to get to work, and we need collaborators. I need Mark Morial and the National Urban League out there with us. I need Hazel Dukes, my second mother, kicking their can the way she kicks my can every day to get it done. We need John Jay, who's going to work with us. The Department of Labor is going to be part of it. Put everybody in the room and find out and reach out to those young people at risk. We're going to support it. We're going to push it. But we need the local leadership to step up. And I need your help on that. There are 500 localities in this state with police departments. Think about that. 500 localities. I need the local leaders to step up. And that's my last point. When the COVID epidemic hit, no one said, can we afford to do this? Nobody. I spent billions of dollars buying masks, buying ventilators, buying this, buying that. I spent billions of dollars. Nobody said, oh, can we afford to spend money on COVID? Why? Because it was a matter of life and death. And when people think they may die, they say, spend whatever you have to spend to keep me alive. That's what they say. 
Well, you know what? We're in a new epidemic. And it's gun violence. And you know what? It's a matter of life and death also. And we can't afford not to commit ourselves 100% to this effort and spend what we need to spend. New York State is going to step up. We're going to pledge $138 million to do everything I told you we would just do in these communities, the jobs, the interveners, and that is going to make a real difference, and we are ready to do it today, my friend. <laughs> this is our time to capitalize. This is our moment. This post-COVID moment, I just got off the phone with all the governors across the state, and they're all talking about how do we rebuild, how do we rebuild, how do we rebuild. I say to them, I'm not going to rebuild. What does that mean, rebuild? Rebuild, build back to where we were the day before COVID? You want me to go back a year and rebuild? I, no, I'm not doing that. This is not about rebuilding. Life is not about going backwards. Life is about going forwards. This is how do we take the lessons that we learned from COVID over the past year, and how do we build a better state, stronger communities? That's what this is about. And whoever does that first and seizes the moment has an opportunity to step ahead. And COVID was hell. COVID took a tremendous toll on us. COVID took years off my life, I'm sure. <laughs> but COVID taught us something. And it taught us something I'll never forget. There is nothing that we cannot do when we are united and we are focused. We can do it. If you can beat COVID, you can beat gun violence, you can beat poverty, you can beat drug abuse. You can beat whatever you want to beat. We just have to want to do it. In COVID, people wanted to do it because it was about them. So they wanted to do it. Here we need the political will. We need the same unity. We need to say to people, this is about you. Don't tell me it's about someone else. It's about other people. It's about black people. It's about brown people. This is about you. This is your black brother, your black sister, your brown brother, your brown sister, your city, your state. We are one. It's all part of the community. And we have to have that same intensity. We live our lives as New Yorkers. We govern this state as New Yorkers based on values and principles. That's how this whole thing works. People say all the time to me, New York, or people from all different places, religions, colors, how do you make it work? We believe in principles and values, and we honor those principles and values, and we don't care what the color of your skin, your religion, your sexual orientation, we live by values. Our values today say we have to stop gun violence. Yes. And it says it for all of us. Self-interest demands that we attack gun violence. Basic fairness demands that we attack gun violence. Civil rights demands that we attack gun violence. Humanity demands that we attack gun violence. Young people are dying, and you know it, and you can stop it. And it's your obligation to do something. The spirit of community demands that you do something. The teachings of love. Your brother and your sister demands that we stand up as one. And we say enough is enough. There's enough blood. There's enough carnage. There's enough young people dying. We're going to stand up. We're going to solve it. New York is going to lead the way. We don't care if no one else has done it. We're going to show you that there's no problem we can't solve. We're going to make this place 
a better place. We're going to come together and make it happen. We must do it. We can do it. We will do it. And it starts today. Thank you and God bless you.